right. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Monica, for, for pulling all of this uh, uh, together and uh, also for citing this conference in this spectacular space. I spent a lot of time yesterday wondering what actually was in these fat columns. Uh, I discovered there's a green room downstairs, and my only disappointment is that we couldn't make our uh, entrance by uh, stepping out of the columns. Um, all right, uh, I have 45 slides, at the pet, which is at, uh, perfectly timed to the Pecha Kucha rhythm uh, of 20 seconds each. I should come in exactly at um, uh, 15 minutes, although I've, I've used up uh, nearly a minute already. Uh, so uh, we'll see if I can get through this in 15 minutes. Uh, this building has absolutely nothing to do with the subject of my talk. Um, it's a recently completed building at Paju Book City in Korea, but we just got the photographs and uh, I wanted to work it into the conversation. <laughs> uh, if, if I had to give you a one sentence takeaway for the future of design, I would say the future of design is transdisciplinary, uh, by which I mean that the boundaries between design disciplines are increasingly being blurred and that most of the interesting work today is happening in space between uh, disciplines. Now, that's a very conscious choice of, of words and I would distinguish transdisciplinarity from the kind of loose interdisciplinarity that uh, Sarah Whiting was quite critical of uh, yesterday. Uh, by transdisciplinarity, I mean, uh, in the first instance, a conversation among design disciplines uh, rather than reaching outside to fields like anthropology or sociology uh, for material. And uh, you, you could say more of a vertical integration across scales rather than a kind of, kind of horizontal integration that would reach outside the discipline. Um, so if there's one of these transdisciplinary conjunctions that I feel somewhat qualified to talk about, it's the relationship between uh, architecture and landscape. Uh, this advertisement was all over the underground last uh, summer in, in, in London. Um, and I, I, I think that there's sort of two reasons, I think, to use this as the kind of icon for, for the, the, the kind of uh, architecture landscape uh, relationship that I'm thinking about. Architecture, architecture, cities, and landscape, in a sense, sort of working at a kind of geological uh, scale. Uh, geological scale and a geological time. Uh, certainly the kind of formal uh, rhyming here interests me, uh, the scale interests me. Um, so uh, what I, what I want to do today is show three projects, but before I do that, I would also want to say that if we're going to work and talk effectively about this kind of conversation among disciplines about transdisciplinarity, uh, and especially in the, in the relationship between uh, architecture, infrastructure, urbanism, and landscape, I think we need a different vocabulary. We need a different way of framing the problem. Uh, so rather than those conventional uh, disciplinary categories, I think it's more productive to talk about, in the first instance, uh, territory. Uh, the large scale, the, 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 the horizontal field-like assemblage that characterizes both the American landscape and the American uh, city. So it's significant that, that there's a natural example here and, a, and, a, and an urban example, although certainly both man-made landscapes. In the second instance, I would talk about systems, and again, both uh, natural systems and man-made systems. And then in the third instance, to talk about objects, definitely man-made. So systems, territories, and objects, uh, these are, in an interesting way, uh, historically very much part of the expertise of architecture and the specific projects that I would show today, again, the interesting stuff happens not in the kind of specific uh, uh, areas of, of, of the diagram of the categories, but in the overlap and uh, cross-pollination between categories. So the conjunction of systems plus uh, objects gives you a more fluid and adaptive notion of architecture. Uh, systems operating at the scale of the territory suggests a way of thinking about infrastructure and the object scaled to the territory uh, produces this notion of the megaform. So to start with the more familiar category, uh, the conjunction of object and, and system, 
and specifically here to look at a large-scale master plan that we're, we've been developing for about two years for the city of Taichung in Taiwan. Uh, Taichung is uh, Taiwan's second city, about an hour south of Taipei by the high-speed railroad. And we were asked to look at the site of the former municipal airport. Here's the center of the city. Uh, the airport, which was built in the 40s, has been absorbed by the fabric of the city. A new airport has been built outside of the city, leaving a 240-acre, uh, uh, 240 hectare empty site, as close as you're probably going to get to a tabula rasa to work today. Now, this presented all kinds of opportunities and challenges, and, and I'm not going to go into the uh, project in, in, in detail. Uh, specifically, uh, what I'm interested in, the, the strategy here was to organize the site around the void, around the void of the park and the public space, in part as a, as a strategic response, because those are the things that, as uh, planners and architects, we, we could control. Um, but what I'm more interested in this context is the capacity of large-scale architectural structures operating beyond the scale of an individual building, specifically this context at the north end of the site, uh, which contains uh, a small stadium, ex um, a conference center, uh, hotels, uh, transportation. The capacity of these large-scale architectural objects to organize urban space at a scale that then in turn begins to encompass uh, infrastructure, landscape, as well as uh, the conventional uh, forms of architecture. So you see the way, for example, that the uh, convention center is lifted up as a bridge that allows the uh, park to pass underneath. Uh, that means, for example, although there's a, there's a landscape on the roof, the uh, the undercarriage, the, the, the reflected ceiling plan also becomes a kind of landscape element. Uh, the three large towers that move uh, as you move along the ring road and create different relationships in, in parallax, uh, again, are operating at the scale of the city, but using the specific uh, expertise uh, of architecture directed at a kind of uh, large-scale urban artifact. So again, moving, pushing at that scale, the way that specific questions of infrastructure uh, can be deployed uh, within the urban context. Um, also, another project, this one in Taipei, uh, we were asked to look at this uh, waterfront site, the Yangping uh, waterfront uh, in the city of Taipei. Uh, site is about a kilometer and a half long, um, and uh, we were asked to, well, uh, the site encompasses the waterfront and also this little uh, piece which were, where there was an existing obsolete parking garage. Now the problem was this. Um, we needed to connect the city, the, the, uh, the park back to the city. Um, between the park and the city is this 8.3 meter high flood wall um, which can't be moved because you have to protect the city from periodic flooding of the river. So, how, how to connect this park back to the city, we necessarily had to intervene into this, this piece of urban infrastructure. So this is our solution. It's, a, again, a strategic solution, uh, which is to say, uh, instead of the strict wall which separates the city from the park, if we were to reshape that as a kind of landform, maintaining, of course, the same uh, sorry, it's 8.6 meters uh, of height, we get the same level of flood protection, but of course we can create a much more fluid relationship uh, between the park and the city. We can create new opportunities for views, for experiences of the city, and we can also then manipulate that landform in plan. We can push the water up to the edge of the city and we can push the wall out and create green space that's then smoothly accessible to the city behind. Now, there's another point which is very important here, which is that everything outboard of the, uh, of the wall uh, has, is subject to periodic flooding. So it's either hardscape or uh, native plants, whereas those areas that are protected by the, by the, uh, the new landform uh, can then uh, have a different kind of planting uh, that will produce a different kind of uh, experience for the park itself. Uh, so you can see here the kind of serpentine form of the wall. 
uh, and the different kinds of uh, program opportunities uh, that that presents ac uh, across the, the, the length of the park. Uh, again, it's a flexible strategy. As the project develops and we meet specific needs, we can adjust that form, but we're always working with the same uh, basic infrastructural strategy. Now, um, th I had mentioned the small site with the uh, existing parking garage, and that was an opportunity to take the path of the infrastructural wall fold it up around on itself and then create a kind of vertical icon of the park uh, by bringing some of the park programs up into this uh, vertical structure uh, so that we have a kind of uh, architectural icon of the park as well as the kind of horizontal extension of the park itself. All right, the third part, the third um, interesting slip there, the third park, actually there they are all three parks, interestingly enough. Uh, the third strategy uh, working with the megaform, that is to say the, the, the architectural object at the scale of the uh, territory. Uh, we were uh, invited to an international competition also in Korea for the uh, city of Guangzhou um, around two artificial reservoirs. Um, but the problem here was that the, the, the definition of the park uh, was highly arbitrary. Um, I would submit that if we hadn't put a yellow line around the site, there was absolutely no way you could tell where the park begins and where the park ends. So there was no, no physical uh, or architectural or urbanistic definition of the park space. And that led us to a solution uh, where the urban park traditionally, uh, of course the example of Central Park, traditionally been seen as a kind of void within the built fabric of the city, a kind of uh, green space that is defined in opposition to the built fabric of, of, of uh, the traditional 19th and 20th century city. Uh, we wanted to repurpose Hans Holein's uh, famous diagram of the aircraft carrier in the landscape as a kind of green infrastructure in this new park uh, situation. So we create a connector from end to end of the park, spanning across uh, both of the reservoirs. Uh, but we also blur the boundaries of that piece of architecture so it can establish new relationships with the landscape around it. So this is the uh, connector end to end, spanning both reservoirs. Uh, the, um, this is the development that's proposed. That is not ours. Uh, but in part, this again is the problem of the site. How using the tools of, of, of landscape do you create something with the power to stand up to the banality of the proposed development around the site? Uh, so here are moments where, for example, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, what we're calling the landscape uh, infrastructure uh, extends out and creates new programs adjacent to it, including in this case uh, uh, an orchard, uh, the floating soccer barge on the southern lake, which was more active. Um, it was very important if we were going to create such a large piece of structure within this natural environment, that that piece of structure had to function within the sort of larger uh, um, uh, local, the larger ecology of the site uh, itself. So uh, this particular uh, piece uh, filters the air, uh, it filters the water, and then it feeds it in turn uh, for irrigation to the orchard that I had showed previously. So uh, that's this piece here where we completely rebuilt and refigured the spillway on that, uh, uh, that piece of the, the northern lake, which is quieter and dedicated more to uh, recreation. So we create a kind of new ground on the top of the building uh, that's then available for different programs and also creates new experiences of the site. Um, there are moments where the architectural presence is quite strong uh, and there are moments when the landscape presence really dominates. I should say, by the way, that Shane Cohen was our landscape architecture collaborator on this project. Um, uh, here's another view of that, that northern spillway, and you can see that here at this point, you're beginning to open up to a much quieter uh, landscape. All right, so uh, again, just to reiterate at the end, a new way of thinking about the relationship between landscape, architecture, and urbanism by rethinking those 
uh, conventional disciplinary categories around the notion of territory, system, and objects, and a way of working that building in one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>